previously on This Old Tony. And now, the dramatic conclusion. This is not a through hole. The drill doesn't go all the way through the part. Drill diameter to hole depth here is about 40 to one. It's five inches deep using an eighth inch drill. That's 125-ish millimeters deep. Deep holes in general are what you'd call anything with about 10 to one ratio, depth to diameter. So 40 to one certainly qualifies. Next time we get into drilling on this channel, we can chat about it more. But with a regular twist drill like this one, it's all about being patient. Peck a little at a time and completely retract the drill to clean and oil it. To some extent, I'm also working on feel and sound. As the flutes of the drill start to fill, assuming you know your lathe and are very intimate with your machine, you'll hear changes as you're drilling and maybe even start to feel the flutes filling up. Granted, if you can actually feel the chips building up in there, you're getting dangerously close to binding and snapping your drill and likely scrapping your work. Go slow, clean often. Oh, and your drill sharpening kung fu really needs to be on point. If all went well, these bushings should fit perfect. Not too tight, not too sloppy, just a nice free running fit. <sighs> Grant me the serenity to accept the dimensions I cannot change courage to change the dimensions I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Did you even look at the print before you started machining?
As the ambassador of obvious, I thought I'd let you know that I moved the part to the lathe. It's mounted in a four jaw chuck. You saw me square this up in the mill and drill the two large holes. The holes now need to be taken to final size and although I could have done that in the mill, like with a boring head, I'm gonna finish the part here in the lathe because one of the two bores requires a countersink on one side. Regrettably, I don't own a fancy boring head that will do facing, that would be capable of cutting a countersink. So had I wanted to finish this part on the mill, I would have either had to make a rectangular countersink or set up the rotary table. And quite frankly, it just seemed easier to finish the part here, rather than break down the vise, install the rotary table, then have to tram the vise back in. But fun fact, one could have made the entire part here, start to finish, right in the lathe. If you can hear that and it sounds a little crunchy to you, it's because it is. The cut technically wants to go faster. At this small of a diameter with a carbide insert, I'd really want to run the lathe at like three times this speed. But because the part is so out of balance, I can't really run it that fast. This particular sequence would run the risk of becoming a Benny Hill scene where the lathe is chasing me around my shop. Since I'm forced to run slower, it would have probably been smarter to move to like a very sharp high speed steel tool bit instead of sticking with the carbide. In this case, the roughish surface finish doesn't really matter. And to be quite honest, I mean, it's not really all that bad. I've got both holes bored to size and the countersink in there. I'm happy with how the bushings fit. While it's set up with the bore concentric, and I've already done the same thing to the other side, I'm gonna scribe a line to help me round this part off. Basically a layout line. This part is gonna end up being like a lozenge shape. And this round is really only purely cosmetic, so not very critical. Here I'm using an internal threading tool, but any sharp point would have scribed this line just fine. So we've been making a lot of parts lately, and not a lot of talking. It's gotten to be unusual for this channel. It's high time I tell you what's going on here. Bushings and the gears you probably know by now. These on the other hand are the four shafts that will do all the behind the scenes work. The shafts are all put together more or less the same way. The gears will be locked to the shaft via a small key. It's this one here, I just haven't cut it to length yet. It looks something like that. So the shaft and gear keyed together ride on these bushings. Everything is trapped together by a few plates we'll get to in just a second. Three of the four shafts, the three that do the heavy lifting, are drilled for oil passages. The ends will be tapped to accept this little fitting here. And the oil makes its way to the bushings via small cross-drilled holes. Now, ideally, the oil ports would be sized so that the oil sees the same amount of resistance, whether it needs to get to the close end or the far end, but come on. This shaft has more holes because the oil's got more places to be. 
At first I thought I'd build this with bearings because of the cool factor, but bearings don't really make sense here. Bearings typically are for high speed and low load, at this size anyway. Small roller bearings want to go fast, but of course you can get them in any load rating you need. They get huge of course and expensive, but they make bearings for just about any design requirements you might dream up. Bushings on the other hand are usually for low speed and high load. Technically a bushing is just a type of bearing, I guess this would be a plain bearing, a flanged plain bearing. For something size critical, especially here where the speeds are low but the loads are high, a bushing just wins. If you really want to geek out, read up on PV rating. It's simply a combination of pressure and velocity. Figure out what that rating is for what you need to do, then look through catalogs to find your bearing. Had I used roller bearings here, it would have just artificially grown the size of this thing with really no real benefit. At any rate, and evidently, I'm using bushings. You also saw me make this thing. What would you call it? A swing link, maybe? This is what makes the adjustment via the screw to the bend radius. It swings around and is held in place by a nearby drive shaft. Yeah, this one, in fact. Again, on bushings. Both parts are separate. One can rotate freely and the other one swing when it has to. I'm showing you these parts now because once this is assembled, we really won't be able to see the details. Now, just the clockwork bits here aren't of much use. I'm going to need a frame or a structure that keeps all these things together. And there we go. Pretty all right looking parts, I think. These are exactly the same, just mirror image. And they're the side plates that all of the parts will be built into. Now, in order to keep this from coming apart, I've had to build a couple of other structural pieces. The biggest one of which is this base plate, for lack of a cleverer name. I'm making these names up as I go along, by the way, so if they change, bear with me. Before I put these parts together, let me take this opportunity to talk about why you don't usually see me finish steel parts on the CNC router. That's a question that's come up once or twice, but unfortunately I don't really have a good answer for you. Now I'm sure if I did some digging I'd find some deep-rooted CNC-related emotional trauma, but fact of the matter, it feels faster to me to work on manual machines. I prefer manual machining. To be fair, I rarely do more than one or two parts. I'm sure if I was doing 50 of something, I'd want the robot to do it all. But for onesie twosies, not having to do all that programming work, tool changing, hoping something stupid doesn't happen to scrap my part, manual machining just wins out for me. Now granted, that's a generalization. There are usually better reasons than that, and I can get into it. But keep in mind, I'm running a CNC router and not a mill. It's a beefy little router, but it's not a mill. I really push that little thing when I'm cutting steel. And to bore out holes like these that I did in the mill on the router would have frankly taken forever. And who knows if it might not lose a step or two along the way and my hole locations are off or break one of those tiny little cutters I'm trying so hard to gnaw the material away with. For me, it's best I let the router do what otherwise would be harder for me to do manually and I could take care of the rest. Even though in this case, this isn't a great example because the profiles of these plates is almost purely cosmetic. These could have been cut out with a hole saw and an angle grinder probably. Tack or bolt them together and then just finish them at the same time so they end up being the same shape. Anyway, let's get this thing together, but bear with me just a minute as I need some nuts and bolts first. Huh, that doesn't seem right. It's on the blueprint for crying out loud. Oh, my heavens. I've finished building up the parts I have so far, which is most of them, to do a quick test fit. Now the first thing I noticed is the gear train isn't quite Swiss watch right out of the gate. 
There are one or two rough spots, which is fine, but I can only get maybe three quarters of the way around and it jams. And the first thing I'd like to try is just changing the gear mesh, like advancing one gear a few teeth and try again. Maybe I just hit on a bad combination. In reality, the gears likely need a little more cleanup. I'm also noticing the end play isn't quite right. I was shooting for about 20 thou, half a millimeter, but I've got more at the bottom. Maybe 30, if not 40. And almost none in the middle. Now, I am missing a top block here, like another structural component. Bolts in at these four locations. And in fact, the two plates are coming together at the top. About 20 thou tighter than they are at the bottom, so that might be my problem right there. Right now, there's nothing resisting that clamping load from the screws at the bottom, other than, you know, the shafts. I'm gonna break this back down and I'll check the gears, clean them up a little bit. I also wanna check the flanges on the bushings. The shoulder links on the shafts should be good, but flange thickness was established with a cutoff tool. I mean, they should be really close, but they might not be exactly the same. That means I could get the end play right if I turn down what might be a thick flange, or maybe simply move them around to a different spot. You know, maybe I happen to put two thick flanges on this shaft and two thin flanges on this one. Henry Ford just turned over in his grave hearing me say that out loud. But in fact, none of those checks really mean anything until I get this top support plate in here and the two side plates parallel. So I'm going to make that next, install it, and just try it again. Now I'm sure everyone's noticed that my counter bores for the screws have broken out the side to one degree or another. I can feel your eyes on them. Anybody ever tell you it's not polite to stare? When these were set up and I was drilling the holes for these screws, it looked like I had a lot of material there, so I made the executive decision to move up to the next size screw. And although that's true, I did have plenty of material for the body of the screw. I didn't think ahead to the size of the counterboard needed to recess the head. We have high-paid engineers in the design department, and you change the dimensions? You knucklehead. Not a big deal here. I mean, I'll clean these up so they're not sharp, but this will be closed up by a sheet metal cover. Had that have happened somewhere else? Well, it just screams professional, doesn't it? Well, I got the end play back. The gears still suck. I'll be back in a minute. Now that's more like it. Okay, not perfect, but a lot better than before. The biggest culprit seemed to be the tooth I had to repair with the TIG welder, where I had the hole in the tooth. It looked good, but I guess close enough here it can be too close. It was that one, and then there were a few other oddball ones. Filed the interference out and then just wire brushed them all again. While this thing was apart, I built the cross pin for the adjustment screw. It's just a small stepped pin, cross drilled with a couple of flats, and there's a sir clip on the back. It lets the screw turn without moving in and out. It's just caught between the two side plates and again is free to rotate as it needs to. Here it is in action. The pin is just down here. At that point, I had to run out to get some eggs and milk, but when I came back, I made the base plate, another base plate, and I welded it to the base plate we saw before. Welding machine components like this, like an assembly of machine components, throwing some welding in there, isn't really the most professional thing in the world to do. But I'm getting so close to finished here, I just didn't have it in me to drill and tap four more holes and countersink it for screws. This new bottom plate does nothing but allow me to bolt this thing to my bench. Drilling and tapping would have been cleaner, but this will work just fine. I did take care, though, to leave a gap between the side plates and this new base plate. It's maybe 30, 40 thou. I can just get a ruler under there. That's just so I can still get the plates off and that bottom plate doesn't interfere with the alignment of the two side plates. Just a little bit of clearance. Though I may have assembled this backwards or differently than I did last time. It doesn't really make a difference which side these shafts come out and which side is sort of the drive side. I'll just have to figure out what's most convenient. The adjustment knob will be up here. I'll figure that out later. It's got to come apart again anyway. Next up, I've got to make the rollers. These rollers, for me, are probably the trickiest part of this build. Ideally, for general purpose rolls, these would want to be hardened, 
not something I can do at this size. Now, in lieu of that, I've had to just use something harder to begin with. This happens to be chromoly. It's not exactly Rockwell a million, but it's better than mild steel. Turning and boring this stuff is fine, but I'll need to cut a knurl on the outside and a keyway on the inside, neither of which I expect to be a particularly enjoyable experience. Knurling can be a bit of a controversial issue amongst machinists, and it's tearing the community apart, I tell you. There seem to be two camps. On the one four-fingered hand, you'll hear that the diameter, or the circumference technically of the work, needs to be wholly divisible by the pitch of the knurling tool. Meaning if you have a pitch of two, let's say, to pull a number out of my bum, the circumference of the work should be some whole multiple of that. Like 20 or 22 or 24, not 21 and a half or 23 and three quarter. The idea behind that is that as you're forming the knurls, they'll sort of mesh like two gears. And if you come around one turn, and you don't have like a wholly divisible circumference, then knurls won't line up and they'll start to sort of cut into each other and it won't turn out right. On the other hand, and the camp I tend to fall into, is that it doesn't really matter. Knurling is black magic, so don't try to make sense of it. Typically, I just keep pushing the tool until the knurls are fully formed. Only if they're looking particularly terrible would you then take a skim pass of a few thou maybe and try the knurling again. Now that's always worked for me. You could argue that technically maybe I'm doing the same thing as camp A, but it's rare that I have to go back and take a skim cut. Nine times out of 10, they almost always work. No special diameter involved. Now, not long ago, though to be fair, I've been having trouble keeping track of the time, a fellow by the name of John Stevenson, who unfortunately passed away, clumsy bastard, in my book put this controversy to rest by successfully knurling a tapered part, where, just to state the obvious, the diameter is constantly changing. It's black magic, I tell you. Getting back to the case at hand, trying to put a knurl in chromoly, I've opted for a fine pitch tool. Probably not the best choice for what I'm trying to do. A little bit coarser may have been nice, but I think this gives me more of a fighting chance, since hopefully the forces involved are a little bit lower. And here, I've got a bit of a Pascal's wager going on. I have turned the diameter down. Let's give it a try. I'm running this with coolant. And by the looks of it, it's probably time to change that coolant. It's getting kind of nasty. The coolant serves mostly to help flush away any debris that gets kind of knocked off the stock. And knurling isn't a cutting operation, so there aren't chips per se. At least not this kind of knurling. This tool is cold forming the material. It's sort of pushing its way in deeper and deeper, upsetting the metal, pushing grooves into the stock and moving material up into the negative space of the knurls, if that makes sense. But little pieces do break off and hopefully the coolant washes those away. If too many stick to the work, they risk being worked back into the material and you don't get very clean knurls that way. So that's the first pass. The band that you see is where I stopped it and restarted it to move the camera. It's looking positive. I had that set up a little bit too slow though. I'm gonna speed it up just a little bit. You do want these to run slow with a modest feed rate. Now in my case, I can't push too hard because the tool post isn't the most rigid tool post in the world. For smaller lathes like this, it's probably smarter to use the scissor type knurlers, but I tend to like these better. I have no real limit on the diameter that I can knurl. So that's it after about five passes, I think that was. The knurl hasn't quite crested, like it's not super sharp, but the forces on my top slide were just getting really high. Like I'm really pushing this tool into the work. But for what I need, I mean, that's got some bite. I think that'll do. Could have gone worse. So that was the easy part. Now I've got to cut a keyway in there. Now, I apologize, I don't think you saw it, but I cut, well, I reamed this after drilling it, and I cut a little V groove just to maybe help me line up small round stock.
And just like that, I've got the three rollers done. Two on the right are keyed, they're the driven rollers. And the oddball one on the left has an extra shoulder and is riding on bushings. We're just pressed in there and bored to size. Now, while you folks are watching me make these, I also painted the ring roller. That's what machinists like to call misdirect. The two drive shafts get keys. I also installed the oil fittings and it's all lubed up. Again, these two are keyed to the shafts and this one's free to rotate. And the rollers are kept on with snap rings or sir clips. These are actually sized to take small like shim washers, maybe like 10 thou, 15 thou, which I thought I had, but I don't. Fortunately for me, however, you know what else I don't have? A snap ring that fits this idler shaft. Maybe I can get a smaller one on there. All right, I know that looks pretty bad. Hopefully it'll do for now. The shaft this roller rides on is larger than the other two. The reason I did that is because it doesn't have the benefit of going through one of these structural side plates. So technically it's longer. And to keep it just as stiff as the other two, I increased its diameter. While we're here, maybe you can see why I also have this step on the back of the idler roller. It's to clear the thickness of that side plate. And I also turned a little aluminum knob. Same knurl on the outside. It's bored for a light press fit on the Acme thread, and it's cross-pinned. You know, I'm really digging this color. This is the gray from the bench shear. You know, it probably took me longer to mask off all of the matching machining faces so they wouldn't get paint on them than it did to actually build this whole thing. But I think it was worth it. Like I said, I really like this gray. I think it might start to rival yellow down here. One day, these will come to be known as my gray years. <clears throat> I know, I know. I'm just as anxious as you are to try this thing out. But before I do that, I just want to make a small guard for the back here close off these gears. There's some very good potential for finger crushing in these areas. I think I'll just use some aluminum. There we go. All right, there it is. The fit up maybe could have been a little bit better. I think that should do the trick. If you're thinking, Tony, you just made that way more dangerous than it used to be. Well, you'd be right, if this guard were permanently attached. But it's in there with a couple of copper rivets, not sort of fully peened over. It can sort of pop off if it has to. Sort of a hook and latch. It's the springiness of the aluminum that's really keeping it on. Anyway, should we try this thing out? All right, let's start off with something not too hard, but I guess not too easy. This is stainless, eighth of an inch, and it's a little bit over an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter. Let's see how it goes. I'm particularly proud of the fact that so far this isn't walking itself off. The material isn't being kicked out by the rollers. I should have put a hex end on here instead of a hand knob. Something I could put a wrench on. All right, well, that was a lot harder than I expected. I mean, not difficult. The drill did all the work. I just mean eighth inch stainless put up a lot more of a fight than I was expecting. But I'm very happy with those results. There's no taper, at least not yet. I'll have to keep an eye on how this thing starts wearing. The flats aren't all that big, which is kind of surprising, though maybe that's more of a function of the stainless than anything else. The knurls themselves held up surprisingly well. Frankly, I thought they were going to be the first thing to go. There are some sh what look like some shiny spots there where they certainly flattened out a little bit, but they're still pretty grippy. That was partially my fault. I think I was going a little crazy with the adjustments here. It really only just wants a little bit at a time. There isn't much marking on the material itself either. I mean, it rubbed off some of that oxide, but there aren't like neural marks in the steel. All right, well, I think that just about does it. I did have the intention of just bending every piece of material I have in this garage into a ring, but it turns out that A, I don't have that much small stock left, and two, this flat stainless I think more than vetted the functionality of this little roller. I think it's a good little addition to the garage. I've always wanted one, and I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of this thing in the future. Oh, one last thing. If anybody knows how much I could have just gone out and bought this thing for, do me a favor and let me know down in the comments, would you? Hope you liked that, and thanks for watching.